Hey everyone, this is George Kroos. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Today I have Nathan Maynard, who is the co-author of Hacking School Discipline, Nine Ways to Create um, create a Culture of Empathy and Responsibility Using Restorative Justice. And I know that we talked right before the podcast and you kind of think about it as Restorative Justice 2.0 and I ask you more about what that looks like. And Valerie Nesmith Arachiga, am I saying that right, Valerie? Yes, Arachiga. Arachiga, and thank you, and uh, who are both actually with High Five uh, Dot School, and uh, Nathan is the CEO, Valerie is the Director of Partnerships, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, school discipline, restorative practices, we had a little kind of briefing here too, because I know there's a lot of conversation about this uh, going on in, in school communities right now, so uh, Nathan, if I could start with you, if you could just introduce yourself, tell us what you do today, how you got there, that's a great place to start. Yeah, for sure. So my name is Nathan Maynard. I've been um, utilizing restorative practices, sort of the 2.0 version that we'll talk about a little bit since 2007. Um, I got started as a youth worker. I worked in Lafayette, Indiana. My first three years, I worked on the violent offender unit. So it was with um, youth that were involved with probation, Department of Child Services that had something that was classified as sort of a violent offense. And they were placed in a long-term residential treatment care center. So I was able to utilize a lot of this work that I was trained on back in 2007 with that population. After three years, I went to the clinical team um, and I did that for four years, helping youth around Tippecanoe County, um, just the, involved with probation, Department of Health Services again, in and out of Department of Corrections, that type of work. Got me involved with education, started out as a college career readiness coordinator, taught CTE classes for about two years, then became an assistant principal for about a year and a half. And then Purdue University contacted me, and I was pretty excited because that's where I went to college for behavioral neuroscience. And they wanted me to help open up their first high school for underserved and underprivileged youth. So me and a, an amazing admin team formed together and helped open up their first high school. Now there's three different schools across Indiana. I'm looking at sort of schooling a little bit in a different way. Um, what I do now is help districts around implementation of restorative practices deeper than just the professional development, something where we're embedding this into a systems approach um, and help co-author the book Hacking School Discipline with Brad Weinstein. Love it. And Valerie, you are the director of partnerships uh, for High Five, but I know you also, as you shared before, you've been in education. So can you talk a little bit about your education experience and uh, what you did before you, you joined this team? Yes, no, absolutely. So I am brand new to the team. I just joined um, high five in December of last year. And so I had the opportunity of serving at a large school district in Corpus Christi um, as a teacher, um, instructional coach, uh, administrator, assistant principal, principal in um, Rockport, and then um, also um, came back and um, tried my shot in middle school and um, absolutely loved it. So after 10 years in elementary, had a couple years in middle school and um, had the opportunity to serve as an ad administrator there and um, was definitely using a lot of restorative practices in my work. And so when I had the opportunity to share what I have been doing in my experience um, with different districts across the country, I jumped at the chance and now I'm here doing that. Yeah. And like, I, I find this, this conversation, um, really interesting, uh, that we're, you were kind of talking before the podcast. So, uh, for those of you who followed me for a long time, I used to be a principal vice principal and, uh, I was always, and I don't even like it. I guess you're using the term hacking school discipline. So I was in charge of uh, discipline in both my roles. And typically it was kind of seen as the assistant principal's role. Uh, but when I became principal, mm -hmm. I actually saw it as um, something I was really good at, something I was really passionate about. And I actually remember my secretary, and this is probably, she's like, you are probably the best at dealing with kids I've ever seen. And so I, when I was assistant principal, so I want to make sure that I continue that as a principal. And, uh, you know, lots of conversations, a lot of, you know, things that I think are really important to what's happening. When we're talking about restorative practices, um, right now, there's a lot of conversation, uh, especially, and maybe it's just where I'm looking on TikTok, um, but there's not really consequences for kids. There's a lot of issues in schools, um, not with discipline, but a lack of, you know, and so Nathan or Valerie, um, any thoughts on that? Like, what are you seeing? And, and like, how is what you're talking about 
and I think that's why we talked about the idea of restorative practice 2.0. How is what you're talking about um, maybe sometimes even being misconstrued in some ways? Because I think, you know, a lot of people in education, one of the reasons I wrote Innovator's Mindset is because everyone was using the term innovation. Yep. But then I say, what does that even mean? And they're like, uh, uh, and they didn't know. So like, how do you look at the idea of restorative practice and like why you use the term 2.0? For sure. Yeah, and I, I and I can start that one and Valerie hand it over to you. Um, you know, first starting out with even like the term of like discipline. So I loved how like the reason why you wrote innovators mindset is because everyone was utilizing that term. Yeah. Same thing happens with discipline, right? There's a lot of connotations around it. The root word of discipline is discerna, which is a Latin word, which means disciple to learn and to teach. So what are we modeling? And that's good discipleship. And what are we teaching in, in our processes? And I believe that we teach with consequences. Like there has to be consequences that takes place. Logical consequences and natural consequences. Punitive consequences is something where you're disconnecting the consequence to the behavior. So true restorative practices with discipline as a teaching tool utilizes consequences as a, a teaching aspect but doesn't remove the behavior from the consequence, which punitive does. So if a kid gets into, let's say a, a fight into the school, yes, there may be a suspension needed. And I believe in suspensions. I think that sometimes they're utilized for a way to keep the environment safe. And that's something that we need in education. But what do we do after that suspension? Because even before the podcast, we talked about, George, you know, the differentiation of even the consequences in homes, right? Like mm -hmm. one family may give this type of consequence. This family may give this consequence. And we don't have control over those things. What we have control over is the school culture and the environment. Mm -hmm. So when that student returns from a suspension, are they doing steps towards making things right with who they impacted? Are they learning a skill gap? You know, what I did at my high school after a student had their second fight, they would go with our counselors for every Tuesday and Thursday for three months in a row. They'd grab their lunch, they would meet with the counselors and work in a small group on aggression replacement training, which is pretty much anger management. So for three months, they would work Tuesday and Thursday with their lunch to build that skill up. And that's a good logical consequence. It wasn't just a suspension, now you're done. It's a suspension and now let's see if there's a skill gap Let's reinforce that skill gap and let's repair any harm that took place at the same time. Yeah. And like the, the idea of like, just like, here's this action, here's this consequence is something that I've always struggled with. And I always always give this analogy to my staff. I'd say like, think about your speeding, right? And a cop pulls you over and says, do you know why I pulled you over? Well, cause I'm speeding. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden the cop writes you a ticket for speeding and like, not having conversation with you or anything and then gives you the ticket and nine times out of 10, what does the person think? Stupid cop, yeah. right? Like they're, they're mad at the cop for them doing the wrong thing because it's just like, here's what you did. Here's the issue. And so is there like, I understand that. And I'm not like, that's not something that I'm like, I get that, but that's how I didn't want to be is that you're actually, you want person the, the the person that's actually making the the action, you know, having issue. And, you know, something I really did that was simple. Um, and it was like super easy for me um, when I would do this with students, when something would go wrong, I would just ask the question, why are you here today? Right? And I would just ask that question and I would sit and wait. And a lot of times the reason I would ask that question is I would say like, because, this is the thing with, with ha what happens in schools. A lot of times, like I would have some information from a teacher, but the kid wouldn't know what I knew. So sometimes they would tell me way more stuff. I'm like, oh my God, that's like way worse than what we knew, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so then, and so they would tell, and I would sit and wait, like I would be patient with it. And the first thing I didn't want to do is say, well, I heard you did this and this and this and this, because their their focus is more on, how I'm a jerk, how they don't like me, as opposed to like listening to themselves. And so they would go through that process. And then after they would do this, I would say, okay, what would you do if you were me? And you're trying to get them, and I, and you're trying to get them to figure out the pathway forward for themselves. And, and this is like, most teachers know this. A lot of kids are way harder on themselves than the teacher would actually be. And I don't know, like Valerie, did you see that, you know, kind of in your role as an administrator, 
Um, like, how did you kind of use some of these practices in the work that you did before you, you took over a direct, as director of partnerships? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things as a teacher, I always um, prided myself in building relationships with kids and building that community in the classroom so students felt safe and students were able to, you know, share and discuss. Um, another thing was, uh, again, in building the relationships with the students and understanding where they were coming from, it was always about teaching them and not just punishing them. Like right. you said, you know, there's a process. And I know that in the beginning, and I'm sure a lot of new teachers out there can agree, you're trying to fix the problem. And then it becomes more about you and less about them. And mm. so I think when you give them the time to process what's actually happened and, you know, Dr. Belinda George gave me this advice. She said, you know, try and asking the student, do you want to make things better or do you want to make things worse? And when I began asking that question to students, they always chose that they wanted to make things better. And the thing was, was it offered them the, the time to process what happened and they were also able to say, hey, you know, she's not just going to punish me. She's going to figure out what is wrong and then get to we're going to be able to solve that together versus, you know, go to ISS. I don't want to hear it. This is what I saw. This is what I heard and move on. And I think that sometimes we don't give ourselves enough time to do that. We don't give ourselves as teachers. We don't give ourselves as administrators because we have so much going on. But um, we definitely get that time back later if we continue to build relationships and go along with um, handling situations, challenging situations, such like that. Well, I, I got to ask you this because this is like an side conversation. Dr. Belinda George, I swear that is Dr. Belinda George, was she's doing like Facebook readings or something yes. like that? Yes. Yeah, I, mean, I actually wrote about her and I think in one of my books. Really? Yeah, she does yeah, Tucked yeah. in Tuesdays. That's right. Yeah. And so like, I remember, cause I, as soon as you said that name, I'm like, oh yeah. Like I remember, you know, and just, just absolutely, uh, someone that was really incredible. And Valerie, one thing I really appreciate about what you just said, that focus on relationships. And I always would talk about, so as a principal and administrator, um, I would actually, uh, be out every morning greeting kids as they walked into mm -hmm. school, I would go out during recess and I, I would do this all the time. And I would say goodbye to kids mm -hmm. and it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's time. It's, it's time that there's other things you need to be doing as an administrator and, and stuff like that. And the, the reason I did that is it would turn hour long conversations into two minute conversations. Right. <laughs> and I always say the worst thing you can say to a kid, if they're ever sent to your office to start off a conversation is what's your name again? Because yeah. all of a sudden it's just like, here's the person that, you know, gives the consequence, doesn't know anything about me, doesn't know who I am. Right. And so you want to build that relationship because it's way worse for, you know, many, and this is something with my kids that, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're disappointed rather than mad. Cause there's, when there's a disappointment, there's like an emotional connection to that. And the thing that I always say to people, and there's, there's tons of research showing this, <clears throat> simply greeting kids in the hallways as they enter classrooms um, is shown to improve reading scores, math scores, uh, it's been shown over and over again. And people say, well, I don't have time. I'm like, you're going to save so much time later, right? It's an upfront investment that you're making in these kids because they have a little different trust in you and you ha have this connection. So I really love that you share that importance of relationships. Now, Nathan, one of the questions I want to ask you, and this is, you know, um, restorative practices, there's, and, and again, it's kind of like, because I don't necessarily think is that you know the the princess bride i don't know like i don't think you know what that means conversation i don't know if you remember yeah. that line from that movie and there's pushback um to it because there's a lot of schools you know where teachers are saying hey there's no discipline for kids like there, there's no consequences that you know they they get in a fight and then they're sent back with chocolate bars to the classroom and we're like we don't even know what's going on so like so before we kind of get into some of the things that you know maybe some of the strategies that would help What's some of the disconnect that's that's happened that's maybe led to some of this, some yeah. of these issues? That yeah, that, that's a great question, and that's something that one of my partners, her name's uh, Laura Morton. Um, she's out of uh, the UK. She did this amazing lit review looking at restorative practices in the United States and like what's the success rate. And it, like what we found in that lit review was really powerful. 
One is there's not good implementation of these practices. There's a lot of professional development. There's a lot of reading of books. There's a lot of great resources out there. But when you're looking at changing something up from a typical punitive discipline setting to a restorative setting, that's a lot of work. That's not just a quick PD, a quick conversation, whatever this may be. So the schools that are doing the initial professional development and doing this up, which is a great spark of something, how are they going deeper into something? Like, what does it look like to put this into a code of conduct? What does it look like to tier your consequences? Because I go into districts all the time that says, like, we've been doing restored practices for three years or five years, and it's and our teachers are complaining. They hate it. It's, right. it's, it's no consequences are taking place. Kids are running the school. It's this. And we start diving into the data and start realizing that there's been no implementation. They copy pasted restorative practices into their code right. of conduct and then got a short two, three day training over doing stuff. And now what they're doing is they're going into it and doing very initial level things. They're, they're doing just um, a conversation instead of a logical consequence. They're doing a conflict resolution, but then nothing happens after that conflict resolution. They're doing a parent conference to bring parents in, but then after that, there's no touch points with the parents or the, the community aspects into it. We've got to tier our consequences just like we do with punitive discipline, right? You don't give the same consequence over and over and over and expecting that to change a behavior. Same thing happens with restorative consequences. You have a kid that did one behavior, here's the first consequence, Here's second time, here's third time, here's fourth time, here's fifth time. But that's good implementation. And what we've seen in the lit review is there's not a lot of good implementation into it. It's more surface level right now. But like when you say like there's no like because I think there's for me, there is like a a, a combination of conversation and consequence, right? Mm -hmm. Not not just like, hey, let's talk about your feelings and then go back to class, right? It was like, hey, there's there's been a wrong here and we have to write it. And it was partly, you know, when I asked those two questions I shared earlier, it was that at some point, that kid is not going to be in our school. And that mm -hmm. kid, like myself, will do something wrong, you know, even as adults. Because a lot of times we're, we're having conversations like, you know, kids do make mistakes, blah, blah, blah. But adults do this too. So you're trying, I'm trying to set this kid up that, they don't, part of it was that when they do something wrong, they don't need someone to say, here's how you remedy this, that they could figure that out themselves. Cause I think that's, you know, from my conversations with you, it's also setting the kid up long term to be successful. It's not about just what's happening in school right now. It's ensuring that kid 10 years from now is able to do that. So it's, it's not a one or the other, but it's, there's a connection to, to both, like the, like having conversations, knowing the kids, but also like, Hey, there's, there's actual consequences for making mistakes. Would that be fair to say? Yes, absolutely. So we don't ever jump into a prescripted method of a consequence. There's always seeking to understand why the behavior took place, looking at the behavior as a form of communication. What is that communicating? Is it communicating that there is a need gap there? As in like, I don't know how to deal with conflict. So when conflict takes place, I get into a fight. Like when I was a kid, I got into a lot of trouble in school. I got into a lot of fights because that's what I saw dealt with in my community. That's what I saw my, my caregivers doing as well. So when I went into a situation, that's the only way I knew how to deal with it was to get into a fight. If, if there's skill gaps like that taking place and we give a suspension, but there's nothing after that taking place, are they learning something? And we don't and we don't want to assume something based on just seeing a kid. We want to know what's taking place. So you always do the conversations. But the gap that I'm seeing right now with it is sometimes we say that con that conversation was the consequence. Sometimes on the initial level, maybe that conversation draws out empathy from that student and they understand how that was impacted and they resolve that harm on that level. Sometimes you have to implement a logical consequence into it and you got to tier that mm -hmm. to help build up the skill. But you always start with the understanding of being more like curious than like getting upset about this certain behavior. Like why is this taking place? And then giving something to help fulfill that, that gap. Yeah. And like, like we, we talked before and, you know, I think there's, you know, a lot of conversations like suspensions are wrong. They lead to only negative results, but we all agreed before and, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Like there is a time and place for suspension. Sometimes sure. it's out of school. Sometimes it's in school. One of the things I'd always say is that 
um, you get a suspension with me for five days. We're going to be besties. Like I'm, you're going to be with me and we're going to be having conversations. And, um, I, I, I actually, Valerie, I'm going to, I'm going to share a story with you and see if you, uh, what you think about this. So there's okay. a rumor specifically, there's this kid in my, in, in, uh, in, uh, in my class, in my school. And he was, he was like very, he was like an interesting kid. Cause he could, he could figure out what an adult's weakness was and he would go at it and this kid's like 10 right and I'm like, yeah. wow this kid like he's got a gift <laughs> but he's using it for evil right right, right? like he, yeah. he he can read people very very well and so i remember he came into my office and mm -hmm. uh he actually so the 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 educational uh assistant came to me and said this kid is like driving everyone nuts and like i can't handle him and you know she I, I said just bring him bring him to me bring him to me and he was just being disruptive right so i said hey you're just gonna sit there you know and just just do your do your work right i got some stuff to do we'll talk in a second right so i'm like do, do you mind if we listen to some music and he's like sure i i guess so i put on like the most annoying polka music <laughs> of all time, right? Yeah. He's like, and he's like, see, this sucks. Turn it off. I'm like, you don't like polka? And I was just like, like just doing this to this kid, right? And I was like, and he was like, Kuros, turn this off. Mr. Kuros, this sucks, blah, blah, blah. I said, and I remember I'm like, no, no, no. And I would just turn it louder and stuff like this. And then, he, and it was funny because I, I, I turned it off. I said, do you know what you are to everybody in that class right now, you are polka music. You are the most annoying. And this is what you're doing to everybody in this room right now. Mm -hmm. And they cannot handle you. So you got to be thinking about this. And like he, and I said, if you want to be in that classroom, you got to be respectful and all this other stuff. If you're not going to be that, it's going to be polka hour with Mr. Kroos every mm -hmm. single day. Right. And he actually, like, I knew that, like, I had such a good relationship with this kid that he knew. And it was kind of like, you know, we had conversations, like we had a million conversations, but it was like, kind of the point is that you're being, I'm being to you what you're being to this kid. And part of it, and I think, you know, Nathan and both Valerie, you, you both touched on this. It wasn't like this kid just got sent to me. I've never talked to him, didn't have any relationship with him. If I use that same process with another kid, they would have not known what to do with it. But because I'm like, this kid, he reacts to, to different things than, you know, different kids. There is a relationship there. Never had an issue with the kid ever again. Never actually got there too, because he kind of saw like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be this person. Like, I don't want to be this. And he actually turned out to be an amazing kid. And it was like, sometimes you just, I, I would sometimes use humor, you know, and he actually, you know, he came back to the teacher said, you know what? Mr. Crowes made me go through this polka thing. And I'm so sorry that I was this to you. Right. Yeah. And it was just kind of like, it was an interesting thing. Am I like, to like it worked, you know, long-term the kid, you know, remedied his situation, but I use humor sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't like, you know, no one was being in danger other than, you know, of losing their mind from this kid disrupting it, Like, am I totally off there? This is more, there is not much research going on into like the benefits <laughs> of polka music for, you know, improving behavior. So what do you think of that value? I've always wondered because it worked, but I don't know if it I mean, it sounds like when a student would come into my office and I would give them time to cool down because they didn't want to talk about what was going on. And yeah. then I would turn on Selena music and I would start to sing. And so they would say like, they would look at me or say like, what are you doing? And I said, well, if you want to come into my office, you're going to have to hear me sing. I love karaoke is what I told them. <laughs> right. Um, but it was always giving them that, that chance to just pause. Right. I think that we right. don't do that enough. Right. And so your humor allowed the student to then see, reflect and see how he was behaving with his classmates. Um, I think we do that we can do that in in that way we can do that with the restorative circle which is something that i did in my classroom as a teacher um you know circling up and having our and just asking a question you know how do you learn the best in my classroom right. and when the other students start saying like i learn better when you know there's no one talking and you know i i need absolute quiet and things like that that person who's consistently making noise or disruptions 
begins to look at themselves and say like, hey, you know, these are my friends that I am bothering and I'm not allowing them to, you know, do their work and do their best. And it is because of me. It's definitely better when they hear it from their peers than hear it from us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's it. But it is about having that relationship, too, with the student. Um I, I love that you used to do that. As soon as you said that, I thought, oh my gosh, I did that too. <laughs> yes, well, I, I think part of, you know, I, I think, you know, like weirdly enough, I want to give the teacher a break from the kid. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And I, mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's probably like that. And Nathan, you kind of said this earlier, there was a little bit of, I remember being such a rotten kid in classrooms. Like I actually knew um, there was times where, um at lunch i know this sounds and it sounds weird but it's like i i understood this so at lunch if i would act up right at a certain time and value you touched on this my friends would think i was awesome and the teacher would send me out and i'd get to miss math so to me that's like hey this is perfect right like right. i like this is what i'm looking for i i have social credibility with my friends so like, I kind of like understood, you know, some of the kids that had issues. Cause I was the kid who had issues, right? Like I was, you know, I wasn't necessarily, I was like a little bit, I, I, I want to say charming, but you know, probably my teachers wouldn't say that at the time, but kind of having that, you know, that disconnect and, um, you know, and, and kind of understood some kids that struggle with that stuff. And I think there, there is a power to this. Where do you find this line though of, and I, I, this is something that was really important to me is that sometimes when we send kids to the office immediately or, you know, you know, get into this, there is a part where the kid loses respect for the teacher. And, you know, like it's a little thing. Is that a conversation mm -hmm. that could be had with the teacher? Is that something that could be there versus like, hey, this actually needs like we need extra support because, you know, like a kid saying, um, you know, like a swear word once ever. You know, is that an immediate send to the office or is that something, you know, like, so where do we find that kind of that line between like what can be dealt with, you know, by the teacher, the person closest versus, you know, when is this actually like we have to like elevate what's going on? For sure. And and I think that th there's a lot of factors, you know, at play. So the biggest thing is the adult has to be regulated to be able to take control over a situation and, and deal out a, a way that is impactful, right? You know, Dr. Bruce Perry, he said a dysregulated adult can never regulate a dysregulated child. So like, I think that first off, like who's the more regulated person to deal with this? If you're a teacher in your classroom and you have this like link tree paper over office managed, classroom managed, like I, the, the first thing before you even get to the link tree thing is like, are you regulated? And if you're not regulated, sometimes that is a, a push in support or a pull out support. Like either one can be beneficial. I personally like push in support because I think that what it does is shows the student that the powers at the teacher level in the classroom. I think a lot of discipline settings and systems bring all the power to the admin. And if you have admin that are amazing at consequences, amazing at follow through, amazing at communication, stuff gets taken care of, but the teacher ends up losing some of the power there. So I right. think that it's really up to the regulation, push and pull out support, and then focusing. Just, Jason, on, just hold on a second. Can yeah. I ask you, can of you course. define push and pull in? Like, can yeah. you define yeah. those? So when I was a dean, you know, I would get, so I had uh, uh, two different types of, of lines that my teachers could communicate with me. I used Slack as a communication cha channel. I had my referrals and my referrals were pull out referrals and push in referrals. Push in referrals means that they need me or somebody part of the student support team to come in and just sit into the classroom and help be like a second person in the classroom. So when you would go into it, me or one of my team members would, the teacher would determine what we were doing. Are you interacting with this group of students over here that they're starting to get a little bit more dysregulated? Are you going over here and supporting me? Are you just a warm body in the room? So the mm -hmm. teacher would define what that push and support would be. A pull out support is typical just a referral, right? Like a student gets into a situation, you pull them out, you deal with the consequences. And what I always try to do is when I would put them back into the classroom, I let the teacher be the one that handled the, the door keeping. Because if the teacher's the one that sent a referral to me as a school administrator, 
and I'm the one that dealt with them, I want the teacher to let that student back into the classroom so the teacher has the power. So what I would do as a school administrator is I would ask the teacher when's an appropriate time for me to bring them back to their classroom. I would pull them back into the classroom. I would step into the classroom and watch the class for the teacher. The teacher would step out, have a conversation with that student over what took place, what's the consequence, what's next steps. And then the student always had to ask one thing at the end. And it's, is there anything else I can do to fix this with you, which was the teacher directly. So then if I was the teacher, I'm thinking about what I need. I might say, I'm really excited about you coming back to my classroom, Valerie, but you have been speaking a lot when I was talking, it was really distracting. So I am gonna have you have an assigned seat for the rest of today's class. And if Valerie threw a fit, got upset, it's easier to deal with that out in the hallway than me dropping them off as a school administrator and bouncing right back out of it, right? So really setting up that stage for success. Yeah, and then this, I think um, just last week I was at a campus, a middle school campus in Delaware. And, you know, right now students are, you know, getting ready to finish school. There's a lot of state testing going on and um, they're seeing a lot of dysregulated students right now. And so I think the reminder of, you know, again, pausing and asking, you know, what do you want to come out of this situation? is so important for an for a teacher also but i think a teach and as a, as a former administrator empowering a teacher to know that that is okay for her to do mm -hmm. i think sometimes our teachers feel like and in just meeting with some last week they said you know well what about the curriculum and we have to get grades in and we have tutoring and we have this and we have that if they just said it's go 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 and i said yes it is and and i completely understand that but it's about how are we going to be proactive every day because we're not just going to be proactive towards the end of the year right mm. those are the strategies that we're not just going we're not just going to start greeting at the door at the end of the year we're not just going to start circles right. at the end of the year this is something that's consistently happening from happening from day one and so by the end of the year students are familiar with it teachers empowered teacher understands what that looks like because i think that that's where the huge disconnect is too again like nathan said pd comes in you provide this that at the beginning of the year and then we don't hear about that until the end and then we're expected to do restorative practices along the way but mm -hmm. yet as a teacher and maybe sometimes, you know, 20 year veteran teacher, how am I going to go to my administrator and say, I don't know what you're talking about or I haven't done this type of work before, you know, um, when you feel like, you know, you've put in the time, but you just haven't experienced that. It, it's it's a it. It is not very easy to do, you know, and to, to speak to. So um, I think administrators empowering their teachers by providing the constant reassurance and the pull out push in is what we all which, what we always talk about with administrators also and these are things that they haven't done before and so teachers in doing that feel empowered like i don't have to leave my classroom i don't i do get to close the close the circle and find out what happens allow the student to repair the harm with me and i understand what happens after the student has done whatever they've done. Yeah. And that, like, I, I really appreciate that proactive approach to this. Um, you know, when in my first years of teaching, and I think this is for many people, you, you do your first day, you have a little, like maybe warm up activity. And then you'd say like, Hey, here's what we're doing for the year. And then, you know, we got, Hey, we got to get through this curriculum. Let's get going. Right. So you're doing this on the first day. Um, and then as I, as I grew, I spent more time using that first week to really kind of build relationships with students, kind of understand who they were, they understood me, kind of building that community of classroom. And one of the things I suggest, and people, especially because, you know, I worked a lot in elementary, um, that I wouldn't decorate my classroom before the beginning of the year, because first of all, I hated doing that. It was, I just, it was torture for me. I hated that. But then, you know, you say things like, it's our classroom, it's our classroom. It's like, mm, is it? Because it's like you're all your decorations, like you kind of yeah. decide the, the, you know, the, the, what this looks like. And so I would actually have materials um, in the room and then I, th we would actually design the classroom together. And it was a great way for me to learn about my kids, who they were, you know, I'd have my own space where I decorate too. And there's things that you had, you know, for, you know, for learning purposes in that space as well. But then it became more of a community and that was really kind of setting up. And again, when people think that they're losing curriculum time, 
uh, reading Covey's Speed of Trust, you build that trust where everything now starts getting done quicker, right? And so like setting that tone, not just from the first day, but really like spending good considerable amount of time at the beginning of the year to build that community where there is that. So like where, how do you see that um, in that process of like actually kind of, you know, setting, cause you know, we're going into the end of the year, but you know, people are already starting to think about next year. Like, how do you see kind of starting off next year with, with that process? Yeah. And, and I think that you nailed it, George. Like, you know, I think in the beginning of the year, we're so ready to get to know our students, right? Like, let's mm -hmm. find out who they are, what they like, try to build up that community. And we're like, all right, now let's get the, get the, get the real stuff right. going on, yeah. the, the curriculum and all this other stuff, that the stuff that we get graded on as the adults. So, like, we have to be intentional throughout the school year around community. Do we have a community in our classroom? Do we have a community in our school? And if the answer is at the beginning, we do, you know, right before spring break, we do because we need it because behaviors are through the roof, then that's not a good systems approach. That's a reactive approach to something. What we talk a lot about and what the case studies show us is good implementation of engagement and classroom management is 80% proactive and 20% responsive. So that's something that you don't do just in the beginning of the school. It's something you do throughout the school. And again, that's easier said than done, but there's a ton of ways to keep strategies going that are intentional with feeding that community throughout the year. I love circle work that Restorative Practices offers. Like I've done it with adults. I've done it with my high schoolers. I've done it with, you know, pre-K kids. Like, I mean, I've done it for the last 17 years and I, I absolutely love it because it's a great way to even process academic content and to go through. And it's such a good way to build community, having everyone together, be able to talk back and forth, have dialogue as a community, not just one-to-one -one interactions. Um, and, and focuses on that. And there's so many other strategies and practices to go into that we can continue to fill our cup to be 80% proactive with that engagement and those relationships. Just like greeting the kids at the door when they're walking in the classroom. John Hattie's research showed that increases engagement by up to 20%. So like even greeting the kids at the door, like, you know, and, and we see this when you go into Walmart, right? You see greeters there because there's positive psychology around these corporations that we spend more money when we go into a place that we feel welcomed into and we're part of that community. But yet we don't do that in schools as an intentional thing. It's always a standalone. It's like this SEL curriculum or this restorative practices stuff, or it's this, it just needs to be embedded in, right? Like yeah. we need to put it in involved because we see the long-term effects and the positivity of building solid community and building solid relationships throughout those buildings. I like Nathan, how you touched on um, doing circles with adults because in speaking with teachers, you know, and in watching TikTok and things like that, Mm -hmm. Burnout is a real thing and it's not just happening, you know, for me in Texas, it's not just happening in Indiana, you know, it's not, it's happening everywhere. And I think if we as administrators look at, you know, because I think there could be teachers, you know, looking at this or administrators thinking like, okay, yeah, fine. That all sounds great. But when do we do that? Right. As administrators, you know, it starts with us. And so what are we doing to model for our teachers in in everyday life when the, our, our staff comes to campus? Are we greeting our staff by name? Are we starting our right. faculty meetings with mindfulness? And when when sorry, when I do that in a, our PD I, I can't even count the amount of teachers that have told me I've never started a PD with mindfulness before. And that and my day was very hectic and crazy. But you using that one minute of mindfulness um, allowed me to focus on what I'm going to learn today. And then also having the teachers say, you know, that's a really great way to transition students, you know, from, say, recess to class or uh, lunch to class. And so I think as leaders, we need to also model what that looks like. So that way our teachers feel um, empowered to do that in the classroom as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and like you both mentioned community quite a bit and uh, a conversation that's happening over and over again is, you know, there's not much support from parents and uh, whether that's true or not. Um, and as a parent, trust me, like my kids are I, I have very high expectations for my kids. So like when I see like 
parents don't discipline their kids. I'm like, have you met me? Like, like this is, you know, so I think sometimes it's kind of like saying, like saying all parents, no parents discipline their kids is like saying all teachers are bad. Are there some parents that aren't, you know, doing what we'd hope? Of course, same as teachers, right? So I don't think it's really helpful to do this. Um, one of the things that I was very, this was a kind of a rule. You never actually ever share negative news about a child through uh, email ever. Okay. Do not do not do that because you are destroying uh, someone's night and you do not understand their reaction. They don't know how you feel about their kid. So um, phone or in person. And one of the things I would always like say, you know, like I remember having these conversations when I have to deliver some news or have some conversations like, hey, you know, like you remember when we were kids? Like we did some stupid things, right? And how did we turn out? And you know, and so I understand that about your child right now. And so like, they'll be fine. Just, just like, don't, you know, understand this too. And I think that was really important for me to show like, Hey, this is a moment that your kid screwed up, but we all did this too. We all screwed up and like, we still care about your kid. And that was really important to me. And so one of the things that I was really adamant about was your first uh, interaction with parents and caregivers was something very positive to sure. build that relationship. Because again, it can turn an hour, two hour conversation, a email to the superintendent, you know, all this other stuff into like a two minute conversation. Cause there's a trust that's built there too. So how do you see some of these practices in how we connect with families and how we bring them into this process? Because I, I know that's a huge conversation that's happening right now. Yeah. And, and I think, George, you really understand that well, just hearing you talk about that before the podcast and now too. parents and, and caregivers are such a huge part of the, the team atmosphere mm -hmm. and we need them. You know, I, I heard this kid tell me recently and it broke my heart. He was like my I forget the line he said, but he was like, I think it was something similar to my mom hears from my teacher every day. But yet my mom's never heard my teacher's voice. And I was right. like, what does that mean? And it was every wow. single day, this teacher was sending an email home about how bad this kid was doing. And I mean, like, and it was just, and it was rough. Like the admin showed me some of the teacher's emails and I was like, wow, like, you know, well, let's, let's talk and let's, let's bring some stuff in. And uh, the teacher was definitely speaking out of frustration and going through, but I was like, man, there's so much disconnect there. The, we communicate mainly from our nonverbals. 93% of what you communicate comes from nonverbals. And that's our tonality of our voice. That's everything that we're doing. So like there, there's so much that we lose if we're just sending digital text messages through some app or, or an email or this. We've got to oh, hear each other. We've got to see each other. We've got to build community back and forth. And I think the families are something that I hear a lot of educators, just like you said, George, like you know, parents need to start giving their kids consequences. They need to consequence their kids. They need to do this as these kids are going, you know, off the wall. And I see that sometimes expectations in the home are different than expectations in the school. Sometimes expectations in the school are way up here and expectations in the home are a little bit more lax for whatever reason. Yeah. So we've got to sort of, and we can't tell one's worse than the other. The only thing we can focus on is building up this proactive sense of community with the families, integrating them in. I mean, voice and choice has always been a big buzz in education, but are we really taking voice and empowering policy change or empowering mm -hmm. something around something to get the families actually wanting to be involved? I mean, I've worked with schools before, but they started out having parent nights with like two, three people. And now they're up to having like 500 plus because again we right. look at it in a different lens not a way of communicating information but a way of connecting individuals to a community aspect and i think that if you're listening and it's a teacher or if you're listening in your district or an admin or a leader you you always got to think about your impact with your stakeholders if you're a teacher your stakeholders aren't just your students and your faculty around you, they're every single one of those families. So mm -hmm. are you going to be proactive and really try to meet those needs and, and get to know them? You know, working mainly at the secondary level, mainly in high schools for four years, it's tough. It's really tough to be a, a high school teacher and trying to get to know all of your families. But you can still gauge the families that you want to connect with that you may not have that easy connect with and really try to get to know them a little bit more. So the first time you do pick up the phone call, it's not, 
hey, you know, your son or daughter's in trouble. It's, hey, I care about your son or daughter and you know me, right? So let's come together and talk about ways that we can help each other out. Well, the so there is um, there's something I used to do and it, based on, and I'm not a principal, so I can't get in trouble for this, but it was actually the code of ethics in uh, where I was uh, administrator was basically if a parent had an issue with a teacher, they were not to actually approach the principal first. They were go directly to the teacher, right? Yep. And so I'd say to my staff, hey, I understand this code of ethics and this is really important to me, but because I'm out of the classroom, sometimes when you get a heated parent coming at you right away, it's probably not the best situation. Do any of you have an issue with me kind of buffering and maybe like kind of, and you kind of talked about this, like, I don't know if it's regulate or de I don't know, like kind of deescalate the situation. Would you rather me work as a buffer? I'm not going to throw you under the bus. I'm not going to do this, but I'm going to maybe like kind of con the situation down. And part of, and I actually was in, I talked about this. I was really good at it. And I think part of it, I refed basketball at a high level at the same time. So I was used to people screaming at me yeah. while running. So like, you know, <laughs> if I'm standing still, it's not a big deal. And so, I remember this. One, so they were very grateful for that because sometime a parent like this teacher nah, 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 and I would not just say, Oh, Hey, sorry, you got to go talk to the teacher. Cause yeah. I'm like, Oh, this is like a terrible situation. Right. Yeah. So I would just kind of like get them, you know, calm down and say like, Hey, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to go talk to the teacher and then I'm going to bring them in. And I would like say like, Hey, this is what's going on. This is what's happening. And by the time they're brought together. Um, and then I remember, so there's one time, a teacher was mad at me because she said it was okay. I did that. And then I did it. And she was like, don't ever do this, blah, blah, blah. And she was so mad at me. I said, okay, I understand. So then the parent came, was like screaming my office. I said, can you just hold on? And I said, Hey, the parent's screaming right now. Do you want, you said you want to meet with them. She's like, no, 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 actually, <laughs> can you do this? I said, oh, I thought you did. And, and so like, it was part like to act as that, you know, sometimes as that buffer, right. And to like, kind of like, Hey, there's, I have, I'm not the one working directly with a child. I'm not the one, I'm not the parent. I have like a little impartiality and I, I want to try to calm the situation down because, you know, maybe act as a mediator and sending these two people together right now is not the best situation. It's going to probably work out worse and it's probably going to end up my way anyway. So can I be, as you kind of bring proactive? Um, I, I guess the last question I have for both of you, because I, I don't know if this, I feel there's some disconnect between what did men, and maybe I'm wrong here. And if I'm wrong, please correct me. What did men think they're doing and the teacher's perception of what's going on? And I'm not saying everywhere, but a lot of places. What can admin do to really support, um, you know, educators right now with these concepts of restorative practice 2.0 that you've talked about? And really kind of like, what is like kind of uh, something that they could implement maybe right away? to best support where, and I guess, I don't know to bet so that teachers feel supported. Cause I think a lot of teachers don't feel supported in this right now because of some of the discipline stuff that's happening in schools. And like, like, and I'll, maybe I'll start with you, Valerie. And then Nathan, if you can follow up, like what could admin do like right away to be, to best support their staff? I'm, I think, um, you know, always being vigilant is important, but I think doing that with as much intention as possible. Right. Um, so if I'm going to be greeting at, if I'm just going to be at the door, then I'm greeting students by name. I'm greeting staff by name. I'm also, I think they can also implement mindfulness in their, um, in their PLCs, in their, um, faculty meetings. I think one minute of mindfulness and allowing the, the teachers to, um, gravitate towards what they want out of the meeting and also center themselves in a calm way, um, I think really helps a lot in that situation. Um, I would also say the push in, pull out. I think that that's probably one of the easiest things too, because I think that teachers in speaking with me say, you know, I send a student to the office and then I don't see them again. I don't know what happened. And so how are we closing that discipline circle, right? And how are we allowing the student to repair the harm with the teacher? And so by allowing the admin to go in and either just push in or take over the class while the teacher comes out and repairs the harm with the student, then I think that that would go a long way with teachers and they would feel supported. Nathan? 
Yeah, I, I would say if I was an admin and I was thinking about one thing that I could take away, I would say focus on intentional communication and not just my communication as a school leader into my educators or to my families or my students, but like what's the communication gap around the building? Like is my educators talking to my families? Is my educators talking with above my students so then the conversation feels like someone's in charge of someone else or is there time that they can be on the same playing field so there's good constructive conversations and dialogue taking place what i see in a lot of discipline settings is poor communication the admin's doing some sort of great consequence but then they get an, a, an email or it's thrown into the student information system and the teacher has to find it and the teacher still feels wrong. They still feel that inside and it's tough to like write, read something and say, okay, now I feel better. Like they need to feel something through it. So me as an admin, I really focus on my communication and I feel like that's such a good restorative practices uh, foundation of things. It's just solid communication. What does it look like to be on the same playing field? George, like what you talked about earlier with like getting like even like a speeding ticket, you know, mm -hmm. like is there is that how conversation feels between even school admin and, and teachers? Totally. Does it feel like you're the police officer and you're going to tell us what to do, when to do it, and when you want to hear your voice? Or is there good, equal, we're on the same playing right. field every once in a while? And when you bring people down together, like that's where people start to feel more safe and like they belong. And that's when community starts to like naturally start to flourish. Yeah. And the, like both of you talked a lot about communication and this is, this is advice I'm going to give to not admin, but to teachers. And I think it's really important. And I used to say this as an administrator and it's very important for me to say this. I cannot solve problems that I do not know exist. Like and the reality is sometimes I feel teachers are really frustrated and they might be sharing their frustration with other teachers, but not necessarily with administrators. And so if you feel that things aren't going, you know, in a way that you're hopeful for, you know, that you're, or you don't understand why things are done a certain way, ask. And this is going to sound harsh. If you feel you're in a place where you can ask, or you're discouraged to ask, then I think you might have to leave the place that I know that's a, I know that's hard. I, I don't think it's good practice to stay in places that make you miserable. Right. Mm -hmm. And when there's mass exoduses from places that says something about leadership that Absolutely. says something about, and I think that's a really important thing. So don't be in a position where you don't say anything because not saying anything has never fixed a problem, right? Mm -hmm. It only perpetuates and makes it worse. So I, I really appreciate talking to both of you. And I know that there's a lot of, um, hopeful, um, uh, you know, people got some strategies, some ideas, I do know this about both of you that um, if people reach out to you um, through your various social media channels, have questions, have thoughts, check out uh, Nathan and Brad's book, uh, reach out to Valerie. Uh, I know they're more than welcome to this. I'll list all their social media information as well. But thanks so much for your time and thanks for joining me today on the podcast. Thank you so much, George. Yeah, thank you, George. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day.